In this lecture, we'll discuss the concept of memory. We'll start by defining a few concepts and then work our way down to a very low level to understand how electrons are actually storing ones and zeros. If you can visualize how a computer is actually storing a one or a zero, then you really will understand memory a lot better. So let's start with the clock. The clock is a tiny electrical wire that turns on and off. It keeps everything in sync. Modern clock speeds are measured in giga, so you're looking at billions of cycles per second, which is pretty impressive. The hardware for the course, the Arduino, has a clock speed of 16 megahertz, still pretty impressive. Let's define ROM and RAM. ROM chips are non-volatile, and they retain information even when power is no longer supplied. And RAM chips are volatile, so when they no longer have power, data is lost. I want to stop and explain these chips here. These are important RAM, RAM chips. So if you flip open your computer, flip, flip it over, or open your, your PC, you would find that there are slots called DIMM slots, and these chips slide right into them. Those are your RAM chips. All right. Keep that in mind, and keep that in your head, because we're going to need to come back to these later. A quick comparison between RAM and ROM. ROM retains information. RAM loses information. ROM is used in the startup process. RAM is usually used when you have browsers open, the normal operations of your computer while it's on. It's very important that we define what a capacitor and a transistor is. Let's start with the capacitor. So there's two types of RAM. There's static RAM and DRAM, or dynamic RAM. Let's talk about dynamic RAM first. A capacitor can store an electron, or store electrons. And when it's full, it holds a 1. When it's empty, it holds a 0. Put billions of these together, trillions of these together, you can start holding some data. The problem with capacitors is that if you leave them alone, the electrons leak out. So the computer has to constantly refresh these capacitors. So imagine two students, one's always slacking, one's always on, ta on, on, on task. One of them has to be constantly reminded and refreshed, all right, get back, on get back on track, get back on track. Another guy, the other guy doesn't have to be told. One's going to be more effective naturally, right? So the capacitor needs to be constantly refreshed. And so the name is given, uh, a name is given to it called dynamic, so DRAM because it has to be constantly refreshed. But let's compare that to transistors. Transistors can also hold data, okay? And uh, when the gate is charged, the material in the middle can either hold some charge or, or it can drain out. When, it, when, when there is, uh, it's kind of the opposite. When, you know, when it's not holding a charge, it's, it's holding a one. And when it's uh, full, it's holding a zero. Doesn't matter, the point is that it has two states and uh, when the gate is charged, you know, it, it can hold one state. When it's not charged, it can hold another state. But transistors do not need to be refreshed. And so they get a name called, they get a name, and that name is static RAM, so SRAM. Uses all transistors. DRAM uses one capacitor, one capacitor and does use one transistor, uh, but the transistor is used as a gate. Here are some key differences between DRAM and SRAM. The important things to note, DRAM uses one transistor, one capacitor. SRAM uses six transistors. DRAM is dynamic, needs to be refreshed. SRAM does not. DRAM obviously is slower and cheaper because of that example I gave where if you have to keep telling somebody to do something, it's going to be less effective than something that doesn't have to be reminded or be refreshed. So SRAM is faster and more expensive because of the transistors. A great example of how electrons are actually leaking out in DRAM is the cold boot attack. So if you were to grab somebody's DRAM chips immediately after they turned their computer off, and you were to look at a picture of the Mona Lisa, for example, after five seconds, she would be intact. After 30 seconds, because the electrons are actually leaking, she would start to fade away. And then five minutes later, she would be completely gone. But this is a great example of how electrons are actually draining in DRAM. The hardware for the course, the Arduino Uno, uses 2K of SRAM. And it also uses ROM. So let's stop for a second and discuss what ROM is and talk about how it's evolved. Let's start from the left side, ROM, the typical read-only memory that we know. This was a hard-coded chip. So imagine this coming in a children's toy back in the day. Today, the toys are more complicated. You know, you, you can actually program them to say your name and stuff. But back in the day, it was just, it would come from the manufacturing, you'd squeeze the hand, and it would, it would sing a song or whatever, right? That was a real ROM chip. That would come programmed. You can never reprogram it, um, and you can never change it, right? Throw it away if, if you don't want it anymore. The PROM chip came along, and you could program it, but once it was programmed, it can never be erased. Throw it away. 
The EP ROM. So if you're, in, you're into hobbies, you would you would start using have have started to uh, see these names. Uh, the EP ROM was erasable, but only with a UV light. So uh, Google EP ROM and have a look at it. You'll see that it has like a little glass window on top. That was for the UV light. You could you could you could actually erase it, but only through that method. And then came along EEP ROM. And this was you know the big innovation. This is what Arduino is using. You can erase it, okay, uh, and it, it can be erased electronically, but it's only byte by byte. And some, and some of them, it would erase the entire thing. As mentioned, the Arduino uses EEP ROM. It can be erased electronically. Another way to store one or a zero, or ones and zeros, is to use something called magnetic media. And a hard drive is a great example. So we're still in a time where hard drives are still in use. Uh, if you've ever dropped your computer and it's, it's been corrupted, most likely you're using a hard drive and you'll see the problems with hard drives. But we're using them today and they're made of discs that spin at a very fast rate. Over them is an electromagnet and uh, depending on how it magnetizes one area or another, it could store one or a zero. They spin and the computer can read from them and write to them. So if you've used, if you, like, like I mentioned, if you've dropped your computer, you've probably had a problem with your hard drive. And, and they, they're loud and they're clunky, and it makes sense. I mean, look at the way they're designed, they're, they're built. They look very complicated. If they're spinning at a very fast rate, you know, you're going to have problems. So they're going away, and solid state media is coming in, and the name solid states the solu it has a solution in it. You know, it's solid, it's a, it, there's no moving parts. And it's using the transistor technology that we talked about. So this is the same technology that we find in our, hard, in our uh, flash drives, our USB drives. How many times have we dropped those and everything has been okay? So I would definitely feel safer with the solid state media drive on the right than I would with the hard drive. So how is that actually, you know, working inside of your flash drive or inside of solid state or inside of, inside of solid state media drives? Well, we talked about the uh, transistor, but let's look at something called NAND flash memory. So NAND flash memory are made of MOSFET transistors that have something called a floating gate. So I want you to imagine the, the control gate closing down on the floating gate. And this is just an example, but it does help uh, visualize what's happening. So close the gate over the floating gate. It would squash the floating gate. And let's say the middle transistor holds a one. Well, when we unplug our computer, the floating gate can go back up in the control gate and it can retain that one or that zero. Registers are another type of storage device that we need to define and understand. In any computer science course, you'll hear the word register over and over and over again, so it's very important that you understand what they are. Uh, let's first discuss what the word size is. When we say the, what, what is the word size of a system, that means how many bits is that system operating on. Okay, so how, how wide is the bus? How, how, how large are the registers? In a 64-bit operating system, everything is 64 bit wide. So we're looking at a word size of 64. It might be 32, it might be 16. Maybe in your course you focus on registers that are 8 bit wide. So that's the word size. So registers can change or they, they can differ in size, but they're always at the heart of the CPU. So here's the CPU highlighted in orange and the registers are, are in there. Close, the closest thing to the CPU. Next to, the, next to the CPU, these two chips on the, right, uh, on the right and the left are the cache memory chips. So they're pretty close to the CPU, but not as close as registers. And then outside of these, somewhere else in the computer, are, are the DRAM chips that uh, go into those DIMM slots. So you can see how cache memory is close, close to the CPU, and obviously cache memory is referenced before the DRAM chips are. 